The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. I will be talking about the performance of deteriorated dry cast structures subject to the impact loading. This is a project that we have been doing with University of Illinois and the Rice University and funded under the NEUP program, Nuclear Energy Nurse programs, as a part of the Department of Energy. So I would like to acknowledge my co-worker, Professor Willem, who has been working with me on this project, as well as the two PhD students, Mohammed and Arzu. They have been working very hard for this research. And this is the outline of my presentation today. I'll do an introduction. I'll talk about these dry cast structures, what they are, what different types of dry cast structures we have. I hope this kind of longish introduction will also help the following speakers. Then I'll talk about the experimental program. Specifically, I'll be talking about the construction of scaled models. We have uh, three casks that we build. I'll talk about those, some non-destructive testing that we have been doing on those casks, and also some tip over impact testing that we are about to start. And then I will present some results from non-destructive testing as well as tip over impact simulations using some computer software. This is basically the general cycle of nuclear fuel here. Obviously it starts with the mining, then there is some conversion going on, and then goes to the fuel fabrication plant where you get the fuels fabricated. It goes to the nuclear power plant after the fuel is depleted, basically you use, you finish the fuel, you need to do something with it obviously. Either you store it temporarily at the nuclear power plant or you think about an interim storage facility. In Europe and in Asia what they also do is the reprocessing of the fuel which goes back to the you know, conversion plant and comes back to the cycle and the rest you just dispose it in a permanent disposal facility. I would like to say a few things about this permanent disposal facility. Probably you have heard about this Yucca Mountain project. This is a project that was initiated in 1978 by the Department of Energy. This is basically a deep geological repository where all the nuclear fuel, spent nuclear fuel in the United States would be disposed or stored. And this project was canceled in 2011 by the Obama administration due to some political reasons, which means that there is currently no permanent storage facility for spent nuclear fuel in the United States. Going back to this fuel cycle here, reprocessing is not being done in the United States, so we don't reprocess or recycle nuclear fuel. And then there is no permanent disposal facility, which leaves us with only two options, which are the interim storage facilities and the temporary storage at the nuclear power plants. These are the two types of storage that might happen at the power plants. One of them is the spent nuclear fuel pools. So immediately after you extract the fuel from the reactor, you basically put it inside the fuel pool to let them cool down. And after a certain period of time, which varies between one to five years, you take them out of the pools and you put them in these dry storage casks. This chart is showing the cumulative metric ton of discharged spent nuclear fuel versus years time. Obviously, as you can see here, initially all the fuel was stored in the pools, the blue, and then as time passed, the pools started to get filled and there was no more space and then they started moving them into dry storage casks. And as you can see here, over the time, these dry storage is going to increase in the spent nuclear fuel. So some numbers from this report here, as of 2011, there is 67,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel in the United States. 73% of this is stored in the pools, the remaining 27 is in the dry storage. And this number grows by 2,000 tons each year. They are cooled off for one to five years in the pools and they are transferred into casks. As of 2011, there's over 1,600 casks that are loaded with spent nuclear fuel. And then there are 58 operating sites, these dry cask storage sites, and there are 63 licensed. The number will obviously increase in the future. If you look at the projections for 2020, there's going to be an estimated 88 tons of spent nuclear fuel, and out of this, 31,000 will be in dry storage, and the number of cast modules will double by 2020. There's currently about 1,600. By 2020, we expect to have about 3,000 casks loaded at 76 independent sites. And this is the current distribution of spent nuclear fuel among different states. As you can see here, there's a lot of spent nuclear fuel in Illinois and it varies by the state. Uh, these numbers will increase significantly by 2020. Basically, it's going to double the number of dry casks, and the number of sites will also increase. 
Now, if you look at these different types of dry storage, we can classify them as above ground and underground. And if you look at the configuration, underground storage is almost always vertical, and the fabrication material is steel and concrete. So there's a concrete vault. I'll show you some pictures, and then there's steel canisters inserted inside the concrete vaults. Above ground, we have both vertical and horizontal storage. The horizontal storage is, again, concrete vaults and steel canisters inside. The vertical storage, either steel or steel and concrete. So basically, the shielding material in the vertical storage will be either only steel or steel and concrete. In terms of numbers, this data comes from a different source here. So the numbers are slightly different. I told you like, there were 1,613 casks. These numbers are slightly different, but almost the same. So this is the total number of casks, almost half and half, vertical and horizontal. Horizontal is a little bit less than vertical. This is the distribution 45-55 between vertical and horizontal storage. And if you look at the vertical storage, majority is concrete casks. So if you look at this 84-85% is concrete casks, the remainder are metal casks. So we are focusing on this vertical concrete casks in this project because of the large number of casks that are being used for storage. As you look at the total number is about 1,600, and the concrete cast is almost half of it. It's actually 46% or so. So because of the large number of concrete vertical casts, we are focusing on those in this project. Now, these are different examples. This is underground storage. You see the concrete vaults with steel casts inserted into these vaults. This is above ground storage, horizontal. Again, concrete vaults, and then we have steel casts containing the spent nuclear fuel inserted into these horizontal concrete vaults. And this is above ground vertical storage. All the ones on the left here, these ones, these are at Idaho, and these are the all steel cast. The shielding material is all steel. There's no concrete here. And this is an example of a concrete cast from NAC International. So these are the vertical storage. Now, these dry cast structures, they are licensed for 20 years, and then with a potential extension of the license for another 20 years. So I expect that lifetime of these structures about 40 years. But as I said, there is no permanent storage facility in the United States, and they don't expect to have one in the next 40, 50 years, so which means that we will have these dry cast structures in operation for more than 100 years. So now when you talk about these long durations, obviously the question comes about the long-term performance of these structures. Since I said we are focusing on concrete cast, the long-term performance, if you look at the mechanisms on dry cast in the long term, there's creep and shrink. This is obviously for concrete. Creep and shrinkage, elevated temperature, chemical attack, freeze-thaw cycles, alkalosilica reactions, and corrosion of reinforcing steel. In addition to these long-term effects, we need to also consider the extreme events specified by the NRC. Some of these are natural hazards, some of them are man-made hazards. In addition to these long-term effects, we also need to look at these extreme events that might happen on the dry cast. Specifically in this project, what we are looking at is the corrosion of reinforcing steel or the ASR damage, alkalosilica reaction damage, plus the tip-over impact. So what would be the consequence of, for instance, a tip-over incident when the cask is deteriorated due to corrosion of the reinforcement or the ASR in concrete? What we have done in terms of the experimental program is that we built three casks. Okay, these are approximately one-third scale casks. One of them was a control cask. We used a typical concrete that is specified for these types of structures. In the second cast, to accelerate corrosion, what we have done is we added calcium chloride into the fresh concrete mixture. And in the third cast, what we have done is we used reactive aggregates, and we added some sodium hydroxide to provide alkalinity in the solution and accelerate the ASR, alkyl silica reactions. Now, we also constructed a pad to do the impact testing, and also we constructed a canister to simulate the nuclear fuel inside the cast. We have been doing some non-destructive testing. It's been approximately one and a half years since we fabricated, built these casts. And we have been doing some non-destructive testing. We have been doing visual inspection, house cell potential measurements for corrosion, and ultrasonic pulse velocity measurements and rebound hammer measurements. I'm going to show you some results from some of these tests. And we are almost ready to do the destructive testing. We are waiting for some equipment to be delivered to our lab to start this testing. We're going to do three types of destructive testing, which is an end drop, a tip over, and a slap down test. If you look at this NAC magnet store design to better understand what are the different components of these concrete dry cast structures, you see there is, this is basically inside the cylindrical structure, which is the canister that holds the spent nuclear fuel. There's a steel liner inside, which is connected to this concrete walls, and these are mainly for shielding. There's a base plate, and there's a lid. The lid is steel concrete composite, and there's some air circulation going on. There's air inlets at the bottom, and there are air outlets at the top, so there's some natural circulation going on to cool down the spent nuclear fuel. 
This is an example, the demo cask that they have built. NAC built this cask for demonstration purposes. They opened it up, obviously, and you can see here the concrete, the rebar, and the steel liner, and the base plate, and the air vents, and everything else. So these are some dimensions of these casks. So what we have done for our project is we looked at different concrete vertical casks from different manufacturers. And these are the vendors, these are the different models that they have. And these are some key dimensions like the height, the outside diameter, the liner thickness, and the concrete thickness, and so on. So the specific numbers are not very important, but if you look at them, they are quite close to each other. There are some differences, obviously, but they are very close to each other. We look at the scaling factor for our cask was 2.8, approximately. And if you look at the scaled averages here for these different concrete casks and the model casks we use, you will see that they are pretty close to each other in terms of these key dimensions. In terms of the weight, the prototype cask is usually you know, in the range of 160 tons. If you apply the similitude laws with the scale factor here, you get about 20 tons for the scaled model. Obviously, we couldn't reach that weight because of the limitations of the density of concrete you can get and so on. The model casks we are going to test are going to be about 9.2 tons, so we are not going to simulate the fully loaded conditions, but we are going to simulate the partially loaded conditions of these casks. These are the different components. We use steel rods to simulate the fuel elements. We built a simple canister from a steel tube. And these are the other parts. This is the steel liner. These are the top air vents. This is the base plate. And this is the lid. We simplify some of the parts to ease the fabrication process. This is the assembled cask here. These are the dimensions for those different parts. These are the fuel rods, about 7 feet tall and 7 inches in diameter. This is the canister. And this is the concrete part. The wall thickness for the concrete was about 9.5 inches, and the height here is, again, about 8 feet, a little bit less than 8 feet, and the outside diameter is 48 inches. The inside diameter is about, I think, 36 or so inches, a little bit less than that. We used some typical concrete. You see the proportions here. The numbers don't really matter. We have some fly ash in the SCCs as self consolidated concrete, which is really typical for these structures, and the specified uh, compressive strength was 5 KSI, about 35 MPa, for this NRH solution to accelerate the ASR process, we removed the fly ash because we know that it suppresses the ASR reactions, and we added about 0.8% by weight of cement of NRH in here to accelerate the ASR. You see here the fly ash is taken out, and then we added some NRH. For the calcium chloride to accelerate the corrosion, what we have done, we used the exactly the same mixture as the control mixture, but we added about 4% chloride by weight of cement. Now, these are some typical parameters of mechanical properties of the mixtures. The SCC was about 5 KSI, and these are the tensile, split tensile, and modulus rupture here. And for NaOH and calcium chloride, we obviously, because of these additional chemicals, we got lower strengths. We have a totally separate project looking into this. What are the effects of having these chemicals inside the concrete on the concrete properties? So we understand that there is some disadvantages of doing this, but there is really no other good way of accelerating these processes for a structure in the lab. Corrosion, you can accelerate in so many different ways for a material specimen, but when you think about a you know, huge structure, how do you accelerate corrosion without adding these chemicals? So it becomes a challenge. We understand that there are some drawbacks, but this is the best we could do. This is the pad. As you can see here, this is about 15 feet by 8 feet by 2 feet. And this is the reinforcing cage for this pad. This is heavily reinforced, obviously. You want it to stay more or less intact during these impact tests. And this is the construction process. This is the rebar cage, again, pouring concrete. We did this at a precast plant. This is after finishing the surface and so on. This is the pad at our lab. This was quite heavy, about 18 tons. We had to rent a huge forklift and so on to move it around. So these are the fuel rods, it obviously simulated fuel rods. We bought these 7-inch diameter and 20 feet long steel rods. We cut them into pieces of about 7 feet long, and then we inserted into this basket here. As you can see here, each rod is about 350 kilograms, and this is a number of them inserted in the canister. For the cast, these are the liners. You can see here with the air vents and so on. This is, we painted them for corrosion resistance. This is what they do in practice as well. And then this is the rebar cages built around the steel liners. This is, we use some sonotubes tubes as the formwork. And then this is the casks, the three casks for accelerated aging testing and impact testing. In terms of the impact testing, we will do three tests. The first test is going to be an end drop test. We will drop these on their bottom from one inches and four inches. And then we're going to do a tip over test like this and we are going to do a slap down test. If they still survive this tip over test, we really want to see some damage in these structures, so we are going to do some sort of a slap down test. So this is the test setup at our outdoor facility. 
at the University of Houston. As you can see here, we have an overhead crane. There is some, maybe I'll show you this picture, this might be a little bit better. We have a retaining structure, retaining frame here so that when it tips over, it doesn't roll to the sides and we have a crane and so on. In terms of non-destructive testing, what we have been doing is, I'll show you some results. These are the hostile potential measurements. We are following the ASTM C876 for hostile potential measurements. Basically, we are measuring, if you're not familiar with this test, we are measuring the potential between the rebar and a reference electrode. In this case, we are using copper sulfate electrode. And depending on the measured potential difference, you basically can predict the probability of steel corrosion. So as the number goes down, there's a higher chance of corrosion in the rebar. So these are some results. This blue is here, the control cask, obviously the potential is very low. The same for the NOH mix over time, it doesn't change much, it actually goes up. And for the calcium chloride cask, there is a very high chance, more than 90% chance of corrosion. As you can see, the potential goes down with time, so there is corrosion activity going on inside the cask due to this additional calcium chloride in there. So we looked at the cracks forming on the calcium chloride cast due to the corrosion. This is zero days. These red lines are showing the cracks on the cast. At 163 days, we get these cracks. 186 days, 225 days, 280 days, 305 days. And we still keep on looking at these cracks. We also measured the crack widths. These are the points that we measured these crack widths at. We used some image processing to get the crack widths. This is showing the average crack width over time. As you can see here, again, there's some increase, and obviously the variation increases as well. We know that also from material testing, we had these material specimens with a rebar embedded inside. We also monitored the corrosion in these, so you can see the corrosion at 28 days and 365 days. Cracks on these material specimens, as you can see here, the cracks are increasing, and also we looked at the mass loss and the crack widths over time. As you can see, there is some significant corrosion going on. This is the same mixture and the same type of rebar. In terms of UPV measurements, we did some UPV measurements both on prisms, some material specimens, and on the casks as well at three levels and four points. We couldn't get any ASR activity. We couldn't detect the ASR from these measurements. As you can see here, in time they are going down, but they are going down with all, for all the casks. But we were able to capture the difference in the concrete strengths for these different casks. Again, we still know that there is ASR activity going on from material tests. We did this ASTM C1206 mortar bar tests. We put them in an NOH solution at 80 degrees. Every now and then we measure this length change using a length comparator, and these are the results here. So basically, if you're in this range of expansion, this is innocuous behavior. If you're in this range, this is innocuous and deleterious. This is potential deleterious expansion. So ASTM specifies 14 days. At 14 days, we had about 0.204% expansion, which classifies this aggregate as a reactive aggregate. And then looking at some material specimens, this is a three by six cylinder. These are the crack maps over time. As you can see here, the ASR cracks are increasing, and the same 4 by 8 cylinder, again, the ASR cracks are increasing. So those are the non-destructive tests, and we're also doing some tip-over impact simulations. So this is some, you're using Abacus for this explicit solution. This is our finite element mesh. This is the pad. This is the cask with some steel inside and concrete outside. We use approximately 50,000 elements. We are using damage plasticity model for concrete and inelastic bilinear steel for steel behavior. These are the concrete compression and tension behavior with the scalar damage changing with plastic strain. And again, these are the steel material models for reinforcement and the steel plates. And these are the finite element simulation results for the steel liner. This is showing the von Mises stress. This is a 36 KSI steel. If you look at the stresses, maximum stresses are in the range of 366 MPa, which is well beyond the yield strength of the steel, which means that we are expecting some yielding in the steel liner during the tip over impact. This is the tensile damage in the concrete part. As you can see here, there is extensive tensile damage in the concrete in the case of impact. You can see here how the cast will be damaged. We are also looking at the accelerations. In this case, we are looking at this point on the top of the cask. This is from the simulations that we are expecting close to 50 G deceleration. These are the reaction forces in the Z direction, which is the vertical direction, and in the horizontal direction. Hopefully, when we do the impact simulations, we are going to compare our test results to these simulation results and refine our finite element models. So in summary, in the absence of a permanent repository for spent nuclear fuel, the long-term performance of these dry cast structures becomes really important. The increasing number of storage sites and the number of casts increases, obviously, the likelihood of an extreme event scenario, uh, such as tip over impact, when these casts are deteriorated. A larger portion of the dry storage inventory is vertical concrete casts. That's why we are focusing on these concrete vertical casts in this project. 
And I think we show that this direct addition of these chemicals such as calcium chloride or sodium hydroxide is an effective way of accelerating these ASR or corrosion processes. If you're talking about a structure, there is not much of another option. And we are doing some destructive testing and we will do some further modeling to study the performance of these dry casks. Thank you so much.